Welcome everybody, my name is Ted Moyer with Redfern Farm Services. I'm here today to speak about bin monitoring. Um, bin monitoring means multiple things. Uh, we're going to get right into the crux of it. Um, we're going to talk about good agronomic practices. Good agronomic practices are everything from the time you're, you're putting it into the ground, your, your pre-planning stages even, uh, to the time it's actually delivered to the elevator and put in the pit. Um, that's what agronomics are, is everything from top to bottom. We're going to talk about the senses when you're monitoring your grain. Everybody likes to, to see it. Uh, we're going to talk about technology. Technology is something uh, that's coming, that's been around for a while. It just continues to improve and gets better all the time. We're going to talk about some of the old standbys, some things that our grandfathers did and maybe our fathers did, and uh, we're probably still doing it too. So, And I'm going to give you some general tips some helpful hints and some useless trivia. Good agronomics has taken a, a sample off every truck as you're dumping it into the bin, taking a good composite average sample as it's coming off the back or the bottom of the truck and then taking that sample, mixing it up and putting it into your composite sample for the whole bin. But before you do that, please look at that sample, take a look at it, look at for, for green weed seeds, uh, parts of the field that may be a little more immature or, or further advanced and, there, and there's just some difference in the bin uh, as it's going into the bin. Analyze moisture on every load as it's going into the bin. This, it, it's going to take you a few extra moments but it's well worth it to know if you've got any potential hot spots and where they're going to be in the bin. So by doing that what you need to do is build a bin record for every load as it's going in. Moisture is, is key to identifying and, and maybe just some comments if there's something a little out of the ordinary. We're storing grain for longer and longer now in the prairie provinces. Uh, IP crops are, are becoming very more important to, to everybody's operation. Um, so there's usually storage premiums and extra dollars associated with uh, IP crops. So we need to make sure we're monitoring our storage, monitoring our investment and managing our risk in those bins. This slide's a little old. Uh, it's, it's off the Canola Council website. We're talking about how long it'll store. Uh, canola will, the higher the moisture and the higher the temperature, the less days it'll actually store. Uh, now with generally higher oil content canola, the graph is, is going to change a little bit and probably it, it's, gonna, it's not going to store as long, especially at higher moisture and higher temperatures. Um, 20 this obviously isn't canola. 20% moisture grain that's binned at 30 degrees Celsius will spoil more in four or five days than 15% moisture grain that's stored at 15 degrees Celsius will in 250 days. So the key to this is heat and temperature are key to longevity of canola storage, wheat storage, anything. Um, when a crop's in the field, we're constantly checking it, whether it's a producer, whether it's, it's myself as an ag retailer, uh, whether it's your agronomist. 120 days on average from the time you plant it until the time you take it off. How many times do you check your fields? When that same crop is in the bin, how many times do you check it and do you store it for more than 120 days? Those are just some questions you need to ask yourself. <coughs> Loss of grain quality during storage is a direct hit to your bottom line. If you lose 2,000 bushels of canola at a loss of $8 a bushel, that's $18,000. That's $18,000 that was there that is no longer there. Spoilage happens on every farm, not necessarily every year, but it does happen. Um, there's probably nobody in the room that could say they've never lost a little bit of grain in their bins or they've lost a whole bin or a partial bin or whatever. So um, as we continue to involve, our, our farms get larger, our storage gets larger, the, there's, there's always a, a time limitation is what happens. And the, usually what happens is the, the small tasks fall off the critical job list. 
and those critical jobs are sometimes things that 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 go into checking your bins monitoring your grain and storage um, as a retail organization we monitor our inventory at least monthly in season we do it at least weekly can can you say as a producer that you're monitoring your inventory that closely <clears throat> everybody's done that test that test of 300 bushels that's 12 and a half percent moisture this is canola obviously and they wait a few days and then they do another test and it's a little bigger well it's it's now it's nine percent moisture well what does that 900 bushels actually average out this is this is a calculation you can use uh, this formula to figure out what that average moisture content is is going going into the bin what you do is you take your bushels multiply it by the moisture percentage that gives you your actual bushels of water that's in those 300 bushels uh, you do that for both the, the wet <laughs> and the dry and then you take your total bushels of wet divided by your total bushels in that sample that'll cut, give you what your average is in this case it works out to just over dry 10.2 percent but there again if you know your bin records where it's in the bin you may know where the hot spots are and everything else but so that's it, it's important to keep your bin records it's important to know how to average out how average out your uh, grain going into the bin so uh, now we're moving more into the uh, the actual monitoring of of grain and storage uh, see smell touch and taste it's probably the most comforting thing in our industry uh, we're very visual our grade standards are visual the crops growing in the fields are visual everything is visual um, so the aspect of being able to see your grain coming out of the bin and checking it is very important to a lot of people because it's a visual industry um, as I say that if you're going to monitor your bins by taking green out of the bin take at least 20% out um, you don't want to take a small portion out like say 10% because you've barely gotten the top of that bin off and normally that's where the hot spots are at the top of the bin uh, so, you, so you really want to make sure you've gotten the top of that bin off go up top check make sure there's no lumps there's no clumps there's no anything and don't put the grain back in until you finish taking it all out if you just take 10 percent out dump it on top of the bin and then take another 10 percent out you've just taken the same 10 percent out so you really haven't checked any more than 10 percent of that bin um, as you're taking grain out of the bin sample it as it's going into the grain cart as it's going into the trucks whatever uh, grab it taste it feel it whatever is, is going to make you comfortable to know that that quality grain is still viable uh, like I said before check the flow from the top of the bin make sure everything's coming down properly so there's pros and cons to everything I'm going to talk about today um, these are all as I see them this isn't uh, industry standards this is me uh, as a whole and something for you to think about the pros of, of the visual testing and monitoring your senses confirm it you know you can see it you can smell it you can touch it you can taste it um, if there's something wrong you can deal with it right then and there you've got the trucks there you've got the augers there you don't have to mobilize and get stuff going if you do it in the winter time it's cooling it off as well so that's a benefit as I said before cooler grain promotes longevity um, the cons with with the visual and and smelling it and tasting it is there's manpower and equipment required um, and it's likely going to be cold although this year we've been pretty lucky it's time consuming you're going to stand out there you're going to if you've got a lot of bins you're going to spend days out there moving grain around if you don't take the right amount of grain off the bin top you're liable to make matters worse if you only take 10 percent off what you've done is taken that potential hot spot at the top of the bin and dragged it down into the very core of the bin potentially causing more more issues the other problem with with turning grain is that if there's problems are there you don't find out until after the fact you're in the middle of moving it and you find you've got a hot spot you've got spoiled rotten grain you don't know until you're actually there doing it 
so now we're going to move into the technology options um, and temperature cables which this is right here are the only option available that will c let you continually monitor the grain temperature inside of those bins <coughs> these cables have an accuracy of plus or minus one Fahrenheit and grain is a great conductor of heat uh, in the old days elevator agents used to hang meat in grain bins they used to wrap their side of beef or their pork or whatever into a burlap sack they'd move grain on a very cold day so and then they would uh, fill the grain bin with uh, that had the meat hanging inside of it they'd fill it with frozen grain and it would stay there till spring or summer or whenever they decided to take it out so it was uh, grain is a tremendous conductor of heat and cold the key to temperature cables is getting the coverage that you want based on your bin diameter um, the radius of these temperature cables are about 11 feet so on a 24 foot diameter bin you actually have coverage of 90 percent it's taking temperature readings from 90 percent of that bin uh, on a 48 foot diameter bin, <coughs> excuse me 48 foot diameter bin you need five cables and you're covering 88 percent of that grain 36 foot diameter bins you need three and it's covering about 80 percent so i said earlier if you're going to take grain out of the bin do at least 20 percent well with these we can monitor 80 to 90 percent of the of the grain temperature inside of those bins without doing anything than possibly hooking in the monitor um, there is also moisture capabilities with some cables um, and they report in four foot increments up and down the cable uh, their accuracy is is only one and a half percent of moisture content um, but with that system you can tie it in you can tie it in with uh, a very dynamic system that will monitor everything from your aeration fans to your your heaters uh, to your vents to what the current weather is what the coming weather is uh, what your inventory levels are you can you can tie the moisture temperature cables into a system that is is almost second to none so my personal thoughts on the moisture cables are they're good if you're taking off large volumes of very moist grain and you're trying to use an aeration system to dry your grain down um, so unless you're taking off high volumes of high moisture grain to me it's maybe a little overkill um, with technology you can install as little or as much technology as you want in your operation uh, these handheld monitors can be plugged in these this is the cable that hangs down inside of the bin you can see that it mounts to the roof this is this swings and, and locks in place based on what your picture your roof of your bin is this must hang down straight into the bin and then this cable goes down the outside wall of the bin and you come up you plug it in you turn it on and it'll read your temperature inside of the bin um, you can also do a wireless transmission where this cable would come off and you would hook in wireless transmitters onto that part here that wireless transmitter would send the signal from this bin to your home computer and record all historical data um, with that historical data you can set up alarms that will ring to your cell phone they'll ring to your send you an email they'll send you they'll basically do everything but wake you up at night uh, pros and cons of the technology options you can monitor anywhere anytime throughout the whole world your conditions are monitored from top to bottom uh, you've got historical data you can see if it's going 
temperature is going up, your temperature is going down. They're very accurate as far as temperature goes. Plus or minus one Fahrenheit is very, very accurate. And with, with something like that, you don't have to spend the time outside in cold, blustery weather turning green. Um, the cons, the drawbacks to the, to the technology is you need to be comfortable with technology and how to use it and believe in its accuracy. Uh, there's also potential for glitches or better yet, lack of understanding of the program and, and how to operate it. Uh, and there is more costs involved with setting up cables versus taking a load out of the bin. So there's been a lot of upgrades to the years over the technology. Um, you can see here, the cables are now anchored to the floor. They're not solid anchored. They're simply tied with, with uh, string or twine uh, to your aeration floor. Uh, in newer setups, there's recessed hooks that you can put in cement or steel floors um, so that you can just unhook it. And as the sweep goes around in larger diameter bins, it doesn't, doesn't bother anything. Uh, roof supports are um, greatly improved over the past 10 years, something I've had a little bit of experience with. And the wireless transmission from these little guys, um, even over the past five years, wireless data transmission has, has greatly improved and it's more reliable. Um, the roof brackets, you'll see in the slide that it's supported on actually four roof ribs. And I've had experience where the roof ribs have been mounted incorrectly. Uh, I had a 70,000 bushel bin in White City, Saskatchewan. We had 15 of, of these bins, and they all had temperature cables in them. And the cables were actually mounted onto one roof rib with a bolt and a washer. So with that force of grain, it, it was pulling down on the roof rib, and the roof was being totally compromised. And for one of those reasons, what, that's one of the reasons we had to get rid of these temperature cables in this instance. So. Um, the floor anchors, in the last elevator I ran, the floor anchors were not an option. What was in its place was a five, six, seven, ten pound weight that was put on the end of this cable and was hung about this level. And as you filled the bin, these weights and the cables would end up at the outside of the bin. So you had absolutely no coverage vertically of, of what you wanted to do. So these, these cables were all, four out of the five cables were all stuck out here. There was one cable in the middle that would actually monitor properly. What would then happen is as you were emptying the bin, these cables with the weights would stay up on the side of the bins until you started the sweep up. And once you started the sweep up in that bin, these things swung in like pendulums. And you'll see in my little slide that the A and the V in this slide stands for Albert and Victor getting smacked around inside of the bin. So we've had a few guys get hit with these weights coming from 24 feet away. Um, we're gonna move on to some of the old standbys. Uh, everybody's probably done it. You take a steel rod, uh, you insert it into the grain as far as you can, you leave it there, or as long as you can stand and freeze your butt off on top of the bin, and you grab it and you pull it out, and you feel all up and down the rod and see if it's hot. We probably still do it. Um, grain probes, lots of people are using grain probes, sticking into the bin, grabbing a sample, pulling it out, dumping it into a pail. It, it tells you if there's anything happened but by the time you dump it into a pail, you don't necessarily have any specifics about whether there's a hot, true hot spot or not, because by the time you dump it in the pail, if you're gonna feel around in the pail, it's already been co-mingled, temperature's changed. Um, grain probe isn't necessarily ideal. Um, the pros of the old standbys, you're on top of the bin, you can smell any musty or mildewy or that rotten stench of a grain. Um, and it gives you some indication of what your investment is doing inside of that bin. How is the integrity holding up of that grain? There's so many cons as I see it to, to the old standbys. 
um, safety, climbing up in the bin, standing on top of a bin, manhandling a large piece of steel or metal or white metal if it's a grain probe. It only gives you a very small snapshot of how that grain condition is doing inside of your bin. And then the longer the grain sits inside of the bin, the harder it gets to insert rods into the grain. As it settles and the air is pushed out of that grain, there's less room for the, for the rods and the probes to go in. It just gets harder and harder in time. So by springtime, you can barely get a rod or a grain probe into the bin because it settled so much. So, um, We're going to talk a little bit about moisture meters. This is a very key part. Moisture and heat are two things that are the key to longevity of any grain in bin. So, um, where do you have your moisture meter? Where is it located? Have you calibrated it lately? And have you calibrated your scale? And how to use your moisture meter? Um, keep this out of direct sunlight. Keep it away from drafts and on a stable tabletop or shelf or whatever. <clears throat> Don't move it around too much, bouncing around down, uh, down a grain truck, uh, in the back of your pickup, whatever. That's not good for it because these connections are very sensitive. You could, you could, uh, you could hurt them in a, in a minute. Check your results off of your moisture meter with your local elevator several times a year and several different crops. Don't just do one on wheat and assume it's going to be close on your canola and flax. Do it on everything. There's lots of companies that calibrate these things. Get them calibrated every three to five years, depending on how much you use it and how you treat it. If it's bouncing around the back of your pickup truck, get it calibrated every two years, possibly. Take your scale. Check the accuracy of your scale. When you go into the elevator and, and you weigh 250 grams out for canola, get that 250 grams, take it back, check the accuracy of your scale. Um, I've had so many problems over the years in the elevator system where guys had just gotten their moisture meter back from being calibrated and it's out by one or two percent. Well, it's impossible. So I sent the sample back with them to check their moisture meter. They got the exact same readings as I did. And then it dawned on both of us that their scale was out. They are either weighing too much or too little on their scale. The moisture meters measure on relative humidity based on a specific amount of grain. If you've got too little, it won't read enough humidity, so your accuracy is lower. If you've got too much in, it's going to be higher. So there's, check your scale. It is very important. Um, it, on canola, 250 grams is what your sample is for moisture. If you're off by 15 grams shy or, or heavy, that's a difference of 6%, not 6% total moisture, but if, if your moisture is supposed to be 10, it could be 10.6. If you're weighing too much, it could be 9.4 if you're weighing too little. So it's, it's very, act, the scale is a very, very important thing and we don't take a look at our scales. We just look at our moisture meters. We got to look at our scales too, folks. Turn it on and leave it on for the whole day. Don't turn it off and on every time you use it. It needs to warm up. It needs to, to get accustomed to its surroundings. It, it's, it's a piece of electronics. Uh, you think of your old TV. When you turned it on 20 years ago, it took a two and a half minutes to warm up. This thing has been around since 1956, I believe. So it's not new technology. Let it warm up, but there's nothing really more accurate in the industry. Let it warm up. You, leave it on for the whole day. Uh, calibrate it every time. You got your calibrate button on the on the front. Uh, you move your dial down to the lowest possible, and then you turn your dial here until you get the low reading on this screen. Calibrate it every single time you use it because conditions change throughout the day. Unless you're using continuously, you shouldn't need to calibrate it um, except for every 10 minutes. But if you're using it intermittently meaning less than every 10 minutes, calibrate it every time, and use your thermometer, folks. 
The most accurate way I've been told in the elevator system is to do it, do your temperature in the dump tube simply because you know what the temperature is of that grain going into your reading cell. We all know how grain cools in the fall and winter. It cools from the top down, on the outside of the bins down, through to the middle, and then back up. The opposite actually happens in the summertime. Warm air rises and, and comes down. So we've all seen, we've all emptied a bin in the summertime and had that pile of crap on the bottom of the bin. And that's actually from your high moisture zone moving down to the bottom of the bin. That's not a, a leaky floor or a drip or anything else. That's actually from your moisture zone moving from the top of the bin down to the bottom of the bin as that grain warms up inside of the bin. Um, I took a few points right from the Canadian Grain Commission website. Um, and unfortunately, I've had some experience with some of these. So, uh, snow on the roof. The absence of snow from the roof bin usually means that there's severe heating going on inside. If your other bins have got snow on the roof and one bin doesn't, that usually means there's problems inside of that bin. Every year in the elevator, there was those dreaded phone calls where guys would say, the water's running off the top of my bin, I gotta do something with it. So please folks, monitor it closely. Um, where there's smoke, steam may emerge from your, from your roof vents, from your aeration fans, from your tubes, whatever. Um, that's a sign that it's actually on fire. It's on fire in some way, shape or form. It's, it's smoldering and wherever it's in contact with air is actually the grain is on fire. Odor of spoilt grain. Um, if you know what you're looking for, and unfortunately if you've dealt with spoilt grain as much as somebody that's worked in the elevator for 15 years, you know what spoilt grain is. You can smell it from a mile away. Well, not literally, but you could smell it a long ways away. Um, several years ago during a wet, sloppy spring, I was buying flax. Trucks were bringing it into the elevator and there was fresh, wet, heavy snowfall. The snow was falling off the trucks, falling into the pit as we were dumping the flax. The flax was 6% moisture, so it was, it was very, very dry. A week later, I'm working, I'm actually loading rail cars and I could smell spoilt flax. When I got done that day, I opened up the bin and there was where the snow had fallen in to the pit, the flax was actually starting to spoil in little pockets inside that bin. So we, we had to turn the bin and save it, but it's not a good thing to know, but once you know what that odor of spoilt grain is, folks, start investigating if you smell something funny on your farm, because you, you can smell it a ways away. Um, brown oozing liquid. That's a state where spoiled grain is at a, <laughs> has become distilled. It's basically whiskey. Um, I've never run into that. Hopefully none of you have ever run into that. Uh, I just thought some of this was funny off of the Canadian Grain Commission website and, and what to look for for monitoring your bins and spoiled grains. So um, I'd like to thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy day to, to listen to me ramble on about uh, monitoring your bins and uh, hopefully we've all learned something here today. Thanks. <laughs>